Hello, hello. Uh, so happy today to have Lauren Scott, who is the Director of Corporate Affairs at CJ Biomaterials. Uh, Lauren, you may not know this, but uh, we've been wanting to get a policy geek on the show for a while because we know as you know, nascent as our industry is, there's such a huge impact that comes from policy. So thank you so much for taking the time and uh, joining in. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm glad to hear we can talk policy and not technical um, science today. <laughs> no, and I'm really happy about that because most of the time we end up talking a lot of technical science and that's something that we really enjoy. But we also know that there is a huge difference that comes from just getting the policies right. We all kind of live in a certain framework, governance, and as it gets tweaked, it just makes such a huge uh, difference to the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm going to actually start with your growing up years. Tell me, tell me a little more about California days, and you call yourself a California girl. For yeah. an immigrant like me, what does it that even mean? Tell me more. Yeah, so no, I bring that up because, you know, a lot of this policy is really heavily focused in California right now, but I was born and raised in California. My parents separated when I was little, one moved to Northern, one in Southern. And so I bounced around the state a lot, but always kind of, you know, stayed in the state. And I ended up going to UC Davis for college where I studied political science. And that was originally just a step to, towards law school. I always want to go to law school, but I really found that I loved UC Davis's program and it was just a very analytical, fascinating program and topic for me. And we got to study cool things like why nation states cooperate and, you know, quantitatively why or what factors play into electoral outcomes. And I really was just fascinated by the field. And right out of college, I ended up going to work for a California state senator. And at that point I was hooked. And so I ended up going from that job. I went and worked in opposition research, which I hadn't heard that word before I started, but it's that all that research that goes into a campaign and all of its messaging and strategy and all of those commercials you see on TV that are so annoying. But it was it was really cool. And back then, everything wasn't online. So you had to go to the county recorder's office and courthouses, dig through campaign finance and meeting minutes. And I did a lot of races for um, state. So then I started actually working directly with state office holders and candidates for legislative offices, as well as local government, members of Congress. And at the same time, in off election years, I worked in the lobbying field and for several lobbyists on a bunch of different issues. Then I took a detour where I worked as a market analyst for a few years, but it was focused on state and local government. And so it really gave me that opportunity to tie in like the business side to the political side. And I think that's been really helpful shifting to uh, work more in the industry section. After that, I went and worked for the American Chemistry Council for almost seven years. And that is the National Trade Association that represents the chemical industry, which obviously includes the plastics industry. And so I've had a lot of experience working on all of these issues that are so important right now, but from that plastic side. So applying those to this job that I have now with CJ Biomaterials has been very interesting. And I just to back up, I started with CJ a little over a year ago now. Oh, that's amazing. And you come with such a huge amount of experience in this space. Uh, so tell me a little more about what got you really interested on the policy side. You know, you you can be so many things, right? You can be mm -hmm. a campaign manager with your political science background, and you can look go, like you wanted to go into law and you could go into public law. So what was it about uh, public policy that took your fancy? And how did that movement happen? And how did you kind of get so deeply immersed in it? I would say it's just so complex. And especially, you know, when I say policy, I'm really, really focused on state level because that's really where my heart is. That's where, you know, the activity is really happening, especially in this field, the stuff that applies to, to packaging. So I, I just think it's, it's a great opportunity to strategically think and have these huge problems that are constantly emerging that you do not anticipate. And you have to really use your creative thinking and 
you know, work with other people, do a lot of stakeholder outreach, get creative, do grassroots, hit problems from all sides. And then there's just this element you can't control, which are elected officials and legislators and what they're going to do. And so it's just a lot of moving parts. And I think it's really just fascinating and challenging and never a dull moment. So I guess I'd say I like a challenge and I kind of like being the underdog or working on things that seem unsurmountable at times. So but there must be so many when you talk about this and like my mind is going through the complexities and there must be so many vested interests and everybody kind of looks at it from their own viewpoint. Right. So. Yep. So how does how do you parse that out that, you know, these are the and of course, you're coming from your own viewpoint in a way. And uh, but you have to also look at it from uh, uh, the viewpoint of a, a state, a nation, a civilization. I guess all those things mm -hmm. also have to be balanced. So how does that even work where where, you know, there are so many vested interests involved? Yeah, no. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is you know, they realize or they think, well, I'm, you know, I have the solution. It's environmentally preferable. It's the perfect solution. But what they don't understand is that there isn't necessarily a similar viewpoint or even a rational viewpoint or a well thought out one when it comes to the people that are proposing these bills that are going to impact everybody. So I think that, and I would say my perspective, you're correct. And it's been I, I do have my own perspective, but I think it's unique in that I came into this space with no understanding or awareness of the biomaterials business. And so I was able to get this perspective, I think, from a very high level and, you know, detached viewpoint of what was going on and what the dynamics at play were. And I think just being able to see that has been I think helpful um, and, you know, obviously met with a little resistance at times by people who don't really understand that people are, you're working in a field that has very entrenched interests, very powerful ones who have been doing this a long time and that you have some kind of unusual distinctive drivers that are pushing policymakers to you know, act in the way they do. And there's, you know, there's a lot of history behind a lot of these positions and you have to kind of just understand that's how they feel and work within that um, in order to be successful. And do you find that uh, in general, people are open to having an understanding differential point of views? Or do you feel that the most of the minds are already made up and you have to play into that? How, how open do you find the lawmakers of the nation? Oh, the lawmakers? They are generally pretty pretty open in terms of listening to the science and hearing and learning about your issues. But I, I think there are so many different decision makers that are working and so many interest groups. For instance, if you have a bill, you probably have a proponent or a, a group that's behind that bill that you're accountable to. And so having other interests come in and so many from so different, so many different sides just makes it, I think, challenging to be a legislator because you have to balance that. Um, and I think it's hard to people need to understand, especially technical folks, that you can't really get into the science. It might be exciting to you, but they're not necessarily going to have that same interest. They'll get confused and and really kind of shut down. And so I think it's important, yeah, to definitely target messages and keep the, the science to a second grade level um, when talking with policymakers. That's such a fascinating uh like revelation to me in a way because i always think that you know there's so much of technicality involved and you see these kind of debates in senate right when somebody mm -hmm. has to present themselves and the senator is not even getting it right when especially you're right when it gets into a little bit more technicality they don't they don't even understand uh, the technicalities but that's a very slippery slope as well so how does one kind of toe that fine line of being able to explain why this is important and yet be able to kind of uh, water it down so that the message will go through. How, how does that even happen? So, yeah, it is complicated. And I know what you're saying because there are a lot of nuances within policies that the technical people that I talk with will just, they will not be okay with it because they say, well, this isn't actually how it works. And you know, they want to argue about the specifics. But I think at the end of the day, you have to look at what is the policy outcome or solution that you need? Like, what do you need to change in that proposal? 
And then how can you very simply state in one sentence why this won't work? And so if you can kind of flip it and kind of approach it in a way that's going to look at a solution and we'll get your technical solution addressed or issue, but we'll also make sense to them. I think that's probably the best solution. Remember that you are not, they're not going to be as technical as you. So I, I see that challenge a lot with people just getting very frustrated because they are trying to explain logic and science and it's just not getting them anywhere. So just kind of looking at the end goal and what you need to see change. Hmm. And do, do you do all these, all the legislators have advisors who might be able to understand the science and bring it to a level where they are able to see a point of view and a counter point of view? Because again, like you mentioned, there will be lobbyists and yeah. lobbyists may come from a very altruistic standpoint, but mostly maybe not, you know, they'll come in from their standpoint, right? So, so they'll try and prove the science and because science is also how you want to look at it and they may want to prove the science and, 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 and that may lead to a differential understanding of a topic. So how does that work? Do they have advisors who can really parse it out for them? Or is it the job of the lobbyists and counter lobbyists to be able to do that? Well, you know, absolutely. And I think especially with term limits, states where you have term limits, the staff is very much the knowledge base and they rely on having good staff, both in the member offices, but also in the committees that really tend to understand the issues a bit more. And, and I'm not saying nobody understands the science. You know, people have their different specialties and there are people who have a science background lawmakers and staff. But I think that, you know, as you said, science can be shifted and, and used in, in different ways. And I think it is a lot of the time. And it is a matter of, I guess, having the relationships and, and discussions with staff members and with all of these people that are making the decisions and trying to educate them on why they're, the science they've been presented is possibly not the best and a complete story. But I also think it's a challenge, especially in our industry, we don't have the benefit of having all of this substantiation that um, others, you know, we're talking about things like microplastics and toxicity and all these things that are big topics that, you know, the NGOs and, and that community, they have a lot of data, but we need the data that can show the other side. And so I think that's another challenge is um, just being a new industry and not having all of that at hand or the resources to necessarily make it happen. Yeah, you can imagine how how difficult that job is to get get it right. Yeah. Um, so let's 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 switch to a little more practical side of things uh, to be able to understand how ultimate my my aim here is to be able to learn from you on how should we position and how should we go forward in order to get the right policies in place. So that's the ultimate objective, mm -hmm. but. Staying with the background a little bit on the American Chemistry Council, was it a wide spectrum of industries? What is, was it agri-chemicals and petroleum-based chemicals and all of that? What, what did the yeah. American, Council, American Chemistry Council include? Yeah, so we, you know, some agricultural, but basically the chemicals that go into anything um, uh, and petrochemicals included. But I mean, I worked on a wide range of issues from chemical regulations. So, you know, those bills that are banning PFAS and phthalates and, and stuff like that, um, to like green chemistry. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, chemical regulation stuff that has emerged, particularly in California, Washington, Oregon. Um, and then also, you know, increasingly over the years I worked there, plastics became front and center, you know, single use plastic bans being very very uh, front and center in the policy space, not only at the state level, but the local level. So. So how did you see it when you were at the American Chemistry Council and how would you counter that idea? Let me let me let me play the devil's advocate first, you know, like before we switch to the industry that thankfully you're a part of now. Mm -hmm. But uh, but when you were at the um, should we call it ACC? ACC uh, yeah. yeah, when you were at the ACC. Uh, there would have been a lot of claims how single-use plastics are harmful. I mean, everything that's on the market is fairly regulated in terms of safety. Industry has made a lot of, they've taken a lot of initiative to self-regulate and have removed everything from their products that has been shown to be harmful. Um, 
I would say, you know, there's federal regulatory programs that are in place that are creating parameters for those things. And now that industry has really shifted away from any chemistries that are problematic and that the new chemistries are a safer version. And that, you know, a lot of times it's, it's a very emotional appeal on specific chemistries and that, you know, in reality and science, they're not necessarily being, there's no exposure to the chemistries um, just simply by virtue of having a product. So trying to um, explain those aspects. So when I look at it from a petroleum perspective, a petroleum chemical perspective, I see that it has, it has actually, in a way, evolved our modern lives so much, right? Everything around us will have some sort of petrochemical and the products and then everything we consume, literally. And it has meant uh, that our lives have become so much more convenient as well as the eco- economics are very different. Uh, the, the, the cost is so much lower. So so I guess, and there are so many jobs that go with the industry, the, the, mm-hmm. the chemical industry there. So I guess the lobbyists there would want to protect all of that. And from a consumer standpoint, I don't want to lose my convenience of uh, of using certain products. Um, so, so if you're lobbying, how would you push that point across that, you know, this is important that it stays? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reason for having these single use products. I, I think that the the restaurant industry is very reliant on them, um, especially smaller mom and pop restaurants and food service establishments really rely on these products to serve their food and beverages. And that's always been kind of a a reason to protect it. I think they are concerned about the costs ultimately going to consumers for using substitute materials. But I think that consumers have shifted and are generally supportive of that that shift to different. And so I I think that consumers, they're, they're at the point where they are more supportive of these new materials. And I think it's just important to leverage that and make sure that policy is in step with kind of the consumer sentiment. And I guess that would always play its part, right? The consumer sentiment. And I wanted to bring it in from a legislator standpoint. Ultimately, mm-hmm. everybody is a politician and they would like to toe the line of the general feel of the public and especially in a dem- democracy like ours. Mm-hmm. So so how much, again, you know, marrying those two ideas that, you know, there is a play of the legislator being responsible for their constituency and uh, there is a case to be made, how much of that would get married, that there is a a consumer sentiment shifting? Guys, look at this. Uh, You know, how much how much can you play on that? So I think that consumer sentiment is really driven by particular the NGO community and by direct efforts to mobilize and activate on specific issues. And that elected officials are very responsive to their constituents, whether that be on the business side and hearing from restaurants that they want to keep these single use plastics as an option um, or hearing from the protective packaging industry, or whether it be hearing from their local community members who are looking to see less plastic waste on their, you know, walking paths and in their rivers and, you know, are hearing about all of this, you know, this data about the detrimental impacts of microplastics and how pervasive they are. So I think it's, it's kind of pushed, like I would say the consumer sentiment is pushed. Obviously, there are people like us who watch the news and, and are aware of what's going on, but also by direct efforts to have people contact their elected officials and create visibility. Yeah, it's it's always interesting what forces play. So two of the things that um, are, are are interesting, and one of them you mentioned, uh, PFAS. Uh, PFAS is a big one, and I'm always kind of uh, in two minds about this. I understand the challenge with PFAS, but uh, when we look at the amount of uh, mind space it's taken, uh, I wanted to understand from your perspective how this has rolled because. Uh, when I look at, say, when I look at a molded fiber, for example, and I'm not going to get too technical, don't worry about that. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah. so, but, but, but if you look at a molded fiber, uh, it has uh, the chemistry that is, it has is that um, the, the oil proofing chemical uh, has traces of PFAS. 
but the oil proofing chemical in the overall uh, product is only 1%. And there is no empirical evidence of there being any leaching into the food. But still, there is a whole law, literally, that says PFAS free. So, so how does that play? You know, like if you can tell me and teach me about the evolution of how something like that, because you're right, it comes from the public uh, mind place where it has already been played so much that this is harmful. And when the push is there, now this is harmful, then people are going to try and make sure, the lawmakers are going to try and make sure that they say PFAS free. But how much of that is actually real or it is just the sentiment yeah. that guides that? That's a good question. I've, I've kind of wondered the same thing because I know industry has committed to removing PFAS from food contact applications. They've also moved, a big topic was the, the long chain chemistries versus the newer, shorter chain See, this is as technical as I get. Uh, PFASs that are being used are much I was, different. I was, I was thinking as you were speaking, you're getting more technical yeah. than me. <laughs> I've been working with a lot of smart people for a while. So, you know, I, I've learned a few things <laughs> over the years. So I would say it is definitely, um, it's a highly visible issue and elected officials like to take those things. They're being pressured a lot by local, you know, NGOs or community activists, reports, whatnot to move on these issues. And I think a lot of the times the concern is that they're not really looking at the science and they're using emotional kind of appeals and people's concern and fear. And that it's not, like you said, not necessarily an, a matter of exposure or harm or risk to the population, but it's something that legislators can do to kind of support their constituents. And, um, and I think PFAS is a great issue to leverage to talk about, you know, potentially why our products offer a better solution. Yeah. Yeah. And but because I'm also told like PFAS is in water that we drink. So, mm -hmm. so it's not, it's not like you are, so you're so right in a way, because it's very emotional rather than actually based in science, because it's so prevalent, uh, you know, you're using fluorides in water and that's creating PFAS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it may not be science oriented at all, a certain, certain law, it may be more emotion oriented, right? Is that, is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? Well, yeah. And yeah, I mean, where do you, where do these PFAS come from? And are they from things currently being manufactured or are they from legacy products? I don't know, but yeah. It's and what, what about, sorry, what about styrenes? You know, like you, you worked with ACC mm -hmm. and uh, there's a huge uh, idea about, you know, especially expanded polystyrene or styrofoam. Uh, I'm sure ACC would have liked that to stay the foam based products, because again, it's so much more economical and better to use in many ways, right? Because you don't need insulation. The, the cups are naturally insulated. Uh, and, and, and you can make arguments like that. Um, but what I'm also told is that styrene kind of tends to leach into products. Uh, did, you, did you come across that challenge when you were with ACC? Uh, so I think that the main, you know, most visible issue with expanded polystyrene is, you know, the prevalence of it out in the, in the world and people seeing it everywhere. And I mean, you see this local bands everywhere and expanded polystyrene products. So when things were percolating, it was very clear that expanded polystyrene products were receiving a lot of pressure and that the moment of reckoning was coming. And so I think that industry was trying to mobilize and proactively create some solutions, whether it be EPR or, um, you know, increased recycling and, you know, collection and handling of these materials. And they did make some good progress, but I think it was a matter of policy catching up before industry could really take those proactive steps. And I think that's a great example of why it's important to really weigh in, be aware of trends, and then proactively think about how you can create a solution before it comes to that. Because I think when we talk about SB 54, which I'm sure we'll get to, that's a de facto ban on expanded polystyrene because of the okay. rates for recycling and dates that it sets are so aggressive that I think it's generally understood that those products will no longer be in the marketplace, save some immense amount of recycling progress made very quickly. Yeah. And that'll be always difficult because... Uh, 
expanded polystyrene has so much air, right? So it's yeah. almost like two, three percent of material. You have to really, you can, you can really make it small <laughs> in the sense if you were to yeah. compress it. And and that's what another guest that we had in a show, like one of the recordings I did in the last few weeks, was uh, what was this, was the CEO of Wincup, which is a big oh, yeah. uh, polystyrene. I, I, mm-hmm. I hope you, I, I propose, I suppose you know them. Yes, uh, but what he, the point he made was very, very smart in a way he said see it's and and you were kind of inferring to it when you said it, it it's light and it floats yeah. right mm-hmm. so that's what he said the challenge is that it's very visible like if you see a river and it won't like nothing will sink the polystyrene will always float it's not as harmful as they make it out to be but because it's so visible uh the people are much more aware of it and uh, and do you see it the same way as well yeah, well, I mean, I personally had to ask about expanded polystyrene. I think it's a, I think it's a, a product with its place. I mean, obviously, it's on its way out, but I mean, it's very light. It's environmentally friendly in in the fact that it is so easy to transport and it is so light on actual material. It's the end of life where we're having the challenges, but I mean, and it's great, great insulator. It has a lot of benefits, but yes, it is. It's those those materials that are really prevalent and that people see. And I think that's why brands have so much pressure on them to adapt and use better materials because their names are all over these products that are out there as well. No, great. Uh, yeah, these are just such, and I guess it also uh, gets into the whole domain of policy making because you always have these two or multiple sides, right? Mm-hmm. And they all have their pluses and minuses and you have to tread that fine line. I can't even imagine what a legislator must be going through and kind of deciding what is that line? You know, who do I pick and choose? But yeah. I'm going to pivot a little bit. So you are you are at ACC, you're doing this work and you shift to CJ. Why? What made you, what, what made that happen? How did, how did that pivot took place for you? Yeah, well, it was a tough decision. I I loved working at ACC. Um, definitely never a shortage of fascinating issues to work on. It, it was great. But uh, CJ really made an interesting case to me and presented me with an opportunity that was great. I mean, they asked me to come in and build out a government affairs program. And it was exactly in the space that I'd been working in. So I had all of this knowledge and history on you know, all of these issues that had been being worked on, you know, for years and years. And now to take that and kind of look at it from the biopolymers perspective uh, was just, uh, it was a really unique and challenging opportunity that I just could not refuse. And I I like the idea and it's been very cool to work for a very nascent industry that has a completely different set of, you know, capacities and knowledge and awareness and and uh, on all this, but particularly in the advocacy space, because that's something that I think, you know, not just CJ, who when I started was very new, you know, entering the US market and really with very minimal awareness of what government affairs challenges they were facing or opportunities. And I think that's true for a lot of the broader biopolymers, biomaterials industry. And from and from CJ's perspective, uh... Why did they want to invest in a person who is going to lobby for them so early on? Typically, what we see is that we formulate an industry group like ACC, and then we enable that as a joint force to kind of put our perspective across. Yeah. Uh, but but what was what was CJ's thinking that you know they're entering a new market? And they have to ultimately invest in somebody of your caliber to come in and support them. Uh, but why do it individually? Why not? formulate a group of people, a cohort, and then do it as a council or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. And so when I joined, they were actually, there were several coalitions that were in the process of being formed that were really focused on PHA. And uh, I think that CJ recognized a few things that one PHA has a very unique set of value propositions, and they weren't sure that an association would necessarily be able to advocate for those really particular issues and that having someone who really understood the business and I at the time had no idea that they thought this was a plus but uh that comes from the plastic side of things I think they saw that as an advantage 
I remember the first time that uh, I was being introduced, they said, oh, this is Lauren. She worked for the plastics industry. I was like, well, okay, now I see. But, um, you know, I think beyond that, the, the fact that people don't move early to get a government affairs person is really a lost opportunity because I think the role is very much more than just lobbying for policies. I think it has a, a very important role in informing the business and the corporate strategy and planning. I think that's a critical role. I think internal education, so really getting the, the heart of the organization to understand and prioritize policy because this is a space that is heavily regulated. And I don't think people understand the sheer impact that these policies that are being proposed will have on the future marketplace. Um, another thing is business development. By getting out there and working across industry partners in the value chain and with outside groups, you're really providing some visibility to your brand and building friendships and networks that I think have shown valuable in the business development side as well. So since you are a nascent person in this industry yeah. of the of the biopolymer space, what have been your learnings in the last year, year and a half? Yeah, that's also a good question. I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been really fascinating. I have never really understood any one issue this well because at ACC, there are so many chemistries and so many issues. I felt like I was, I knew very, very little about a whole lot of stuff. Um, but I've really had a chance to kind of dive into a lot more of the science limited, but um, behind PHAs and behind different biopolymers. And I've also, when I started, they said, hey, Lauren, we know we care about 54. We need to hire somebody and they need to help us with SB 54 and, you know, other stuff. But I don't think they knew why or what exactly SB 54 would do. And I think that kind of understanding is very common across the industry. And I think that the sentiment was, oh, it will be great for us and um, it will be really a boon to the industry. But beyond that, I really think there wasn't any understanding of how, and that has been a challenge and a road to figure out as I go through just kind of how this weave of policies is set up and how it will potentially impact the industry. And what do you see as the biggest challenges uh, right now for the industry to be able to prosper? Because you're so right, one policy tweak can change the whole landscape, right? So, so you know, one change in the, in the, in the law can make a huge difference uh, to the way the industry grows. Um, so in that, in that realm, uh, what, do you, what do you see are the top, say, three to five challenges that the industry faces right now from a public affairs perspective? Well, so I'd say there are challenges on both sides on the industry itself that I think can definitely be overcome. And there are challenges in terms of the policies being presented. And I would say on the policies being presented side, the sheer volume of activity is immense. I mean, it's, it's a lot. And there are just so many bills that are coming across across the country. And then you have major states like California implementing the most significant regulatory program on packaging to date. You have other states that are in rulemaking for extended producer responsibility. And I would say so extended producer responsibility is a huge challenge um, because of the volume and also because uh, compostable products don't necessarily have the visibility and they're not necessarily accounted for in all the regulations. And I think that there's a lack of engagement by industry on these issues. And there's also an issue with infrastructure, um, really a big challenge on making sure that we have enough processing infrastructure. And so making sure that EPR programs are serving to support the development of that needed infrastructure is really critical. I would say some of the other challenges are PCR or uh, recycled content mandates that it's mostly the devils are in the details with these packaging policies. And I think it's important to understand how they might impact um, inadvertently the outcomes in the future of compostables. And, and I'm sorry, I'm focusing heavily on compostables. It just seems like a really common end of life uh, you know. I'm totally with you. So okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> keep and going. I think another thing is just misinformation. 
about some of the packaging. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of NGO pushback on biomaterials not necessarily performing as intended or just some pseudoscience that I've seen, you know, kind of inserted into discussions around some of these bills and the fact that industry and on their side, the, that industry really hasn't had the level of awareness. I mean, these are companies that are very much focused on developing a business and a technology on building out a product, and they're not really set up to engage in policy or even be aware of it. And so you have a lack of real understanding and awareness. And I think that that is definitely going to be a challenge that, and I think people are becoming more aware and engaging more. And so I'm hopeful that based on that, there can be some insertion of these perspectives in the policy proposals. And that has been my number one goal is to try to advocate and educate anybody and everybody across the space and really support them because ultimately we're all going to succeed. And I think that's CJ's perspective is that the more I can do to support everybody, our competitors, other value chain members, customers, other allied interests on issues, the better because we need a bigger voice. Oh, absolutely. And I'll continue with that now that I have a a captive expert. I'm going to continue with that education piece. Uh, we throw these terms a lot, EPR, PCR, etc. Can you throw more light on this? Uh, and, and a lot of our listeners might understand at a very superficial level, but, but with you here, you know, it'll be great to dig a little deeper. What does EPR really mean? At least yeah. the two terms that you said, and if any other comes to your mind, then, then add that on. But tell yeah. us some more about these terms and what they really mean for the industry as such or the packaging industry as such. Sure, yeah. So I think that the main thing to understand is that policymakers generally are operating now on this belief that a manufacturer, ir irrespective of material, needs to be accountable for their product and the end-of-life management. You can't just put a product out into the marketplace and that's it. You're going to be responsible for accounting for how it is going to be managed and in every detail and making sure it's actually getting managed. And I think that expectation is different from before where you could say a product was recyclable and it was taken at face value, but it wasn't actually being recycled. There's some, everyone's upset about that at this point and is really shifting to this model where they, they have that expectation that the manufacturer really be held accountable, financially accountable for that. And so EPR is a natural, it makes sense that this is really the trend of the day. Um, currently, we don't have any implemented EPR programs in the US. We have four states that have officially enacted EPR uh, bills and that are in different stages of rulemaking and pre-rulemaking. And then we have a couple other states that are have done pre-EPR bills where they're doing... And then the term EPR is extended producer yeah. responsibility. Right? Sorry, yes. No, so, sorry, just, just wanted to make sure that... You... Yeah, extended producer responsibility. And basically, these are all approached differently, but they're all focused on this requirement that manufacturers pay into the system per product they put in the marketplace. And then the that money goes into building out the needed processing infrastructure and making sure that the costs of managing those products um, is covered by the manufacturer. And states are approaching it in different ways and with varying degrees of specificity. And California would definitely be the most specific and aggressive form of that. And uh, just just continuing with the with the acronyms, uh, PCR or post post consumer recy recyclability, right? Recycled That's content, right. yeah. Recycled content. So 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 yeah. If you can throw some light on what that means for the listeners as well, please. Sure. So that's been kind of a new issue that's popped up on my radar um, in terms of issues that impact our products. Is uh, states are creating these requirements that there are certain thresholds of recycled content that go into products. And so, obviously, compostable products made out of a biopolymer would not be using PCR. And so, making sure that there are exemptions in place for bio based um, products so, such that they don't have to use this content and are still in compliance with the regulations. 
And what happens, Lauren, if the voice is not there on the table? Will it totally get ignored or bypassed? What is what is what does that look like to you if you don't have a voice on the table? Yeah, so that's what I'm seeing, and that's what we're still at the very early phases. Luckily, there aren't really many policies in place that are officially done and acted, and so there's still an opportunity for industry to mobilize and weigh in. But I think otherwise, it just goes, it gets looked over and it goes into the official legislation and policy. Engaging and weighing in is so critical. And that's why it's important, I think, to educate and why a lot of my time is spent making sure everyone is in the loop and educating others on on these issues. And hopefully people are, you know, weighing in on important things like this. Yeah, and that sounds really dangerous in a way that, you know, even though most of the people making the laws, the legislators are also consumers, but that said, you know, they have limited bandwidth. And if we don't get a voice on the table, then it's on us that, you know, the, the, the policy doesn't include something which was probably critical as uh, as as a civilization even, you know, to to have on the... Uh, on on board that policy. Two things that uh, came to my mind as you were talking about the EPR norms. What happens to things like the multi-layered substrates, like flexible packaging, which is which are not really downcyclable. I, I I kind of get troubled by the term recyclable, so I tend to stay with downcyclable. But okay. they're not even downcyclable. Uh, and uh, and and again, EPS, for example, it possibly could be downcyclable, but you know it's kind of difficult to collect that much, and 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 actually makes no economic sense uh, to actually go into that recycling stream. So so how does how does one address something like that, a product which doesn't have an end of use at all? It's not even going to go into any circuit. Well, yeah, and I think that's the problem and why industry is really backing advanced recycling technologies for processing some of these hard to, re- hard to recycle um, materials. But yeah, I think that films and, and expanded polystyrene are definitely in a position where they're going to be met with challenge. And, you know, without chemical recycling, which in states like California Um, are not, that's not really an option on the table in California. They're not supportive of advanced recycling. I think a lot of states are. There's been, you know, a lot of work around getting model legislation and supportive legislation across the states. And I think there are, I think more than half of the states at this point have advanced recycling legislation. Um, But yeah, I see, that's where I see a real opportunity for a compostable alternative would be in those applications that are not downcyclable. I'm glad you used that term. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, so why why is California against uh, that idea of uh, recycling? I don't I don't know specifically, but I would say that you know their recycling code is very old and it was based on a time when maybe they were pursuing. Um, waste to energy or pyrolysis technologies and that this isn't something that necessarily is supported across the NGO community and with the policymakers in California. I just know it's something that they don't consider as a viable solution or as a true recycling technology within their vision of a circular future. Interesting. Uh, So you talked a little bit about, and you've talked a lot, or you inferred a lot to California. So so my presumption is that how the states make their laws um, influences other states. What Mm -hmm. about nations? When I look at certain nations, they are more forward-looking on sustainability. EU in general is considered to be, you know, like uh, at a a, a more advanced stage, quote-unquote. so how does that influence? Do you have to kind of read through those laws to inform your understanding? Uh, and do the legislators also kind of tend to see what is the global uh, movement that is there apart from the states? Yeah, well, so I think, yeah, that's correct. I think a lot of, it depends on who the state is and and, and your audience and their political leanings, but uh, a lot of Looking at Canada in particular, um, you know, California has really been presented with their EPR program and uh, looked at other states and their programs that they have in place. I think that nationally, whether or not you leverage these examples or who the administration is in in Washington, D.C., very much 
depends on your audience. So states like California may be less receptive to what the federal government is doing at times, um, but more open to other countries and seeing examples in terms of they have toxic regula regulatory programs. Those are often looked to in terms of creating their own policies. And I think within the states themselves, it tends to be the case that policy spreads like wildfire. So if you have one state that implements a, a policy, then you are very likely to see it be introduced in other states. That's interesting. And I guess uh, that makes your role even more imperative, that focus on one state, get it right. And if you get it right, and especially if it's a more forward-looking state like California or Washington, then it will. what you're saying is that there will be other states that will pay heed to that and, and take, be influenced by that. Yeah, yeah. So whether or not that's good or bad. And, and I think a lot of groups are recognizing this and creating these model policies that are beneficial and are trying to get them implemented in different states, just recognizing that, which can be a good thing. I mean, if you have solid policy, then it would be great to have it duplicated in other states and it would provide industry with a little bit more consistency across the states because I think that's another big challenge is this patchwork of regulations on all of these topics and how to keep up with them. Yeah, and United States, of course, the states hold so much sway on topics like that. So so it becomes such a disparate uh, scenario where one state may still be using foam happily and, you know, the other state <laughs> has gone way beyond that. I I travel a lot to my wife's home state, which is West Virginia, and, and there is no going away from styrofoam. Really? There is every, yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> every picnic that we go to, I have to literally shut my eyes. Well, my mother-in-law knows that now, so she refuses to buy it, but but otherwise it's so tough uh, to see. Okay, that takes me well to the, the, uh, the California SB 54, and you inferred to it again a little bit before. Would love to hear from you what that is and what that means for California and for the rest of the country and maybe even rest of the world. Yeah, so the first thing I want to say is that the details are still emerging. I mean, it's currently in rulemaking. And so none of this is set in stone and um, very much still an opportunity to engage and influence things. But um, SB 54 is what many people call an EPR plus program. It has those traditional EPR principles that are basically requiring fees be levied on products, packaging products or single use products that are sold into the marketplace and that those costs will fluctuate depending on how challenging your product is to process um, and a variety of other factors. There's actually a provision that provides for a reduced or eco-modulated fee for anything made from a renewable feedstock. So that is a, a provision that is very positive for the industry. And then there are some real problems in terms of the compostability side of the issue. It also has a source reduction provision, which applies to plastic covered products that says you need to have 30% less plastic covered products in the marketplace. So it's set that source reduction level. And then the other thing to note about it is that not only is it creating these rates and dates for recycling and meeting, you know, increasing rates, but if you don't meet them, your product is then banned from the marketplace, which is unusual and unique to California because traditionally and in the other programs we see that this, this isn't the case. So it becomes more imperative to really work out the details um, in order to be able to comply with the regulations and continue to be sold in California. The issue with compostables is a little bit complex and it ties into a couple of other policies, but I'll do my best to kind of outline those issues here. And so the bill broadly says that everything in the state of California needs to ultimately by 2032 be recyclable or compostable. So very much a positive positive goal. But again, you know, when you look at the details, the way that they're setting out to define these things is really presenting a problem for compostable products. And the way it's doing that is that it's setting these acceptance rates for compostable products that are very accelerated and very high. And they're saying that in order to be eligible to be labeled compostable, you need to be accepted by 50% of the industrial composters statewide effective immediately, which would be 2025 when the regulations go into effect, and that 
by January of 2026, you have to be accepted by 75% of industrial composters statewide. And this is a problem because this is very new. You know, we don't have the developed infrastructure and acceptance across the composters. And this is something that one would hope the EPR funds that were collected could then go into efforts to fix these and to generate, develop more infrastructure and generate that acceptance that's needed. And so I think that that, that is a, a bit of an issue with the regulations. Another one is that home compostable products are not accounted for. And so by virtue of not being in the regulations, they're essentially not offered a compliance pathway. Right now, the draft regulations, they were released by CalRecycle on March 8th, and then that initiated a 45-day comment period, which ends on April 23rd. Hopefully, what's going to happen is that CalRecycle is going to review all of the stakeholder input that they received during that period, and that they will then revise their drafts and produce a new document, which will then go out and it will initiate a second rulemaking period. And this may happen more than once. And each time they make significant adjustments to the draft, they have to put it out for public comment. So there's still a lot of opportunity. We'll see what they come up with on this new revision. I think people are really mobilized and, and hoping to get them to amend their approach on those issues. And that when we see the new language, we'll have a better sense of how that's going to look. But then again, there'll be another opportunity for people to engage and really work to improve the regulation. So hopefully at the end of this process, we can have something that really will benefit the industry and allow for future success. On the, on the side, you mentioned a few things which are very interesting and particularly the composters side. So what are the challenges the composters face? Is it the rate of degradation for, uh, say, a packaging versus a food waste versus a yard waste? Uh, how do you see that? How do you see us being able to convince the composters that they should take this packaging? Uh, as far as I know, most composters don't even take food waste. So so how does how would that work? Because that's a pretty stiff guideline on 50% yeah. acceptance and 75% acceptance. So how do you see us changing their thinking? And they must be having their challenges that 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 is basically leading them to thinking in a certain way. And what would those be? Yeah, so, well, first in California, we have mandatory curbside collection for residential and commercial for food scraps now. And that's something that's being rolled out and still very much a challenge for local government. So composters are really under a lot of pressure and really trying to manage these massively increased amounts of material. But I think less so about the performance of the products and more so about a couple of things. One is that it's very difficult for them to tell the difference between a traditional plastic product and a compostable product. That's our goal, right, is to create these products that are as effective, and we can do that now, but it's often hard for them to differentiate. And so often they're looking to just sort out the materials along with all of the other plastic contamination that they get and then put it in the landfill. That's easier for them. Another big factor playing into this is this uh, federal framework, which is the organic standards. And basically the National Organic Program creates, um, has a list of allowed substances for organic compost using organic agriculture. And no compostable packaging, as far as I'm aware, is on this list. If they accept the packaging, they lose their OMRI certification and they can't sell their product as an organic compost, which would get them a higher price point. So their interest is really in maintaining that organic certification. And because of this, there are efforts by the Biodegradable Products Institute and others to work to amend those standards. And BPI submitted a petition last year asking for the USDA to initiate rulemaking to uh, revise these standards and include a definition of compost feedstock that would allow for these packaging products to be allowed organic inputs. And so that process is underway, but also a big factor in why composters are reticent to accept these packaging materials. I'm also told that the rate of composting is an issue because, uh, because you know, like a food waste may degrade differently from a yard waste versus a packaging 
uh, ways. Yeah. How do you see that playing from their perspective? That uh, if I have a certain pile that I expect to turn over in 90 days and certain components do not meet that number of days, like do not degrade in 90 days. In fact, we were working with a composting uh, the, the company uh, and, and they basically told us because of the oil proofing chemicals that we are adding, hmm. the rate of composting slows down. And even when they break it down, as in they cut it in smaller pieces, it still takes time. It's not composting. So it's just the rate. They're saying it will compost. It's just the challenge of, you know, we need to do it in this number of days. How do you see that playing? So I'm not, you know, an expert on composting and uh, I won't pretend to be, but I do know that composters are being faced with an immense amount of material and looking to turn their piles much more quickly. And I think that does present a challenge. And I think they also don't necessarily think that the timelines that the compostable products industry are using are necessarily aligned with how they're managing their materials and their process. And so you are correct. I do think that is an issue. And I think they're looking to increasingly expedite that process and move material as quickly as possible. That's another challenge for sure. And it's in their economic interest. The, the faster yeah, exactly. they can turn over, the more compost they can tackle. And that's what they, the tipping fees is higher in that, that case. So that, that would automatically, that would be an incentive. The faster it composts would... Yeah. definitely enable them to take more. I'm also intrigued by, you know, you know so much about the recycling bit and and, uh, and that, that, that whole uh, space as well. And uh, what I'm also intrigued by and why I use the term downcycling also is because many times as, as users or consumers and public, we see, think when you say recycling, we think that this plastic bottle is going to become a plastic bottle again, which typically doesn't happen. It'll become a fiber and it'll go into your, your pillow and then or your clothes and then that's it you know it cannot be this cannot be recycled as far as i know or downcycled anymore as far as i know so so what i'm trying to say is that ultimately there's this downward spiral and at some stage it will not be downcyclable anymore and it could be a very poor quality black colored mm -hmm. poly bag or it could be a poly polyester uh, piece of clothing or something else or just fibers in your pillow um, how does the how do the lawmakers uh, or or the or, or the legislation see that? Because you can keep talking about recycling, but there has to be an out in the end. And how would you price that? How would you put put a premium on that sort of thing? Because there is there has to be an end, right? With with a product mm -hmm. which is compostable, like the one that you are working on, there is an out. There is always an out. Yes, you can recycle or downcycle. But in the end, if it gets strewn or goes to a landfill, it will degrade. Faster or slower can be in question. But do you have an insight into how do, how do these discussions happen and whether they see this uh, issue at all? I, would, I think that particularly in California, policymakers are not, you know, really fully believing or supportive of recycling in general. And I think they are aware of that. Um, and see beyond that though really the fact that these materials are not necessarily actually being recycled so i think that's probably the driving issue but there is an awareness that it's not necessarily a fully circular forever solution to this and i think that's why compostable packaging offers a different story i think that's a story that needs to be told more clearly to the lawmakers because I think there's some challenge and some of the pushback that you hear is, well, what does this have to offer compost? I mean, do we have this huge volume of compost and no longer do we really need to have the compostable packaging in there um, in order to offer any benefit? And I think what they're missing is the fact that it's a better alternative to these materials. And often in scenarios you cannot recycle because it's food soil, because it's a film or or something like that, and that now you're turning it into valuable soil amendment, and that truly is circular. Um, but uh, and just the value of it bringing all of that food waste, as we all talk about the severe impacts of food and landfills and methane emissions, and how it's impacting global warming, and um, the need to really recover those materials and compost them. I think it's compostable packaging is a critical tool in that. And I think that's really needs to be a, a story that is told regularly and often to the lawmakers so that they really start to understand. Well, 
makes me glad that you're there now to tell the story. <laughs> but yes. and what about the um, input side? Again, uh, we we kind of mentioned it in the in, at some point, but uh, ultimately they are all coming from a non-renewable resource as well. So so how does that come into play? Because okay, you can make recyclable, downcyclable products, and they might even if you say that okay, in perpetuity they would be in the circularity. Uh, but then they are still being made by a resource which is non-renewable. And uh, ultimately, that is also of concern and the amount of carbon it takes to be able to produce that. Do you see those discussions happening and being being, being prevalent in, in the conversations? Interestingly, not as much as I would have expected. So the thing I've noticed about the policy landscape is that everything is really heavily focused on the end of life. And I was surprised to learn there weren't more policies that were being proposed that look at the feedstock side of things and uh, the shift from fossil fuel based products to renewable products. Um, like I, I mentioned that SB 54 does have a provision that provides a reduced fee for those materials. That's one example of a policy. Um, other than that, you have like the big federal USDA bio preferred program, which uh, is a voluntary labeling and federal procurement purchasing program that uh, looks to prioritize and promote um, renewable feedstock based materials. But beyond that, there isn't really much legislative work in that space. And I think that's definitely an area to focus on and to try to drive some more policy that supports that because there needs to be some financial incentive and government support to really create that successful shift that needs to happen from those materials. And I think it's a good case. I mean, you hear a lot of dialogue about the need to reduce plastics and eliminate them and the fact that they're petroleum based and, and about the manufacturing process. And so I think it's a great opportunity and one that industry really hasn't made a ton of progress yet on, but hopefully we'll see more of that in the future. And what about things like LCAs? How much, how much value do they hold when you look at something holistically, as in right from uh, the, the inception of the product to the closure or the, or the, or the end of uh, use of a product? So, so something like, uh, and again, again, LCAs can be debatable as well, but overall, do you see them having their place and, uh, being able to certify that something is lower carbon emitting. Do you see that as part of the conversations? There's a big push to make companies accountable for and disclose through a lot of these new disclosure requirements, their carbon impacts. I think LCAs are important in demonstrating the, the benefits of some of these, but I also think that the Plastics industry has a lot of LCA data and a lot of good arguments in that field that really support their position. Um, I think that basically the opponents will pick out parts of your LCA and of your manufacturing process that are weak compared to others. And, you know, a big part of that is how do you compare necessarily when you're not operating at scale? It can be difficult to really have that great LCA as you're just in pilot phase or, or reduced manufacturing capacity. But um, I, I do think that they will hone in on certain things. Like, for instance, if you're using a crop-based feedstock, there's been some pushback about using food and essentially taking it out of, uh, you know, baby's mouths and land use, um, their water use. There are a lot of potential concerns there. I think that one of the feedstocks that's generally... Um, seen more positively and gets less pushback would be those things that are generated from waste products um, and that are going into the, as the feedstock for these products. There's also now some pushback where they're, you know, looking at potential unintended consequences associated with that, like, you know, with methane and the establishment of these mega dairies um, to generate these products that are being used. So it's a complicated and I think that people are going to push back especially entrenched interests who have a stake in the game against any of this data um, that we provide. But I think just telling the story is important and hopefully we'll gain some traction. So, so the next, next uh, query that I have is like two part interconnected. Um, you mentioned land use and that's always intriguing for me and the way we have used a lot of petrochemicals and, and a lot of the land is degraded. 
And of course, uh, you know, if we can add more and more compost, they would that would help. But uh, at present, uh, there is not enough push incentivization to the farmers to use more and more compost instead of the inorganics that we use currently, continuing to degrade the land. So fundamentally, what what the first part of my question is: How do we make uh, compostables more desirable and and then come into more vogue? And uh, then the second part is that I think that interconnects well with what you were saying in terms of land use so that the in demand increases and hence there's an economic value. I don't know if you see the connect in those yeah. and, and how, do you, how do you tread that line on making it more interesting and to have economic value? Yeah, well, I think those are great, great questions. And I think that, you know, it makes sense for policy to create new requirements and support for the use of compost via incentive programs and, and using them for state projects. I think there's a lot that can be done to boost that um, compost market. And I think that it's an effort or it's a matter of people beginning to start these conversations and really pushing proactively some of these states to do some of these policies. I know there are states that have done this successfully in localities in Minnesota and other places that really do a good job at creating this end market for the compost. And it's created a very well-working system. And we can definitely pull on those examples and try to duplicate them elsewhere. But, you know, this is a matter of people really need to prioritize it and build out the market and policy and um, in the policy arena to really drive all of that success in the future. So hopefully we can encourage people to to uh, prioritize and mobilize more actively on policy, because I think these are all great ideas. And do you see are there other ways you see? compostables or compostable products or packaging becoming more coming more in vogue uh, in comparison to recycling that seems to be taking the fancy and it's much easier to understand uh, do you see other ideas at play there i think consumers are very supportive consumers are saying that they are very interested in compostable packaging i think that um, it would become more in vogue if there was more support, more support of consistent labeling practices and product design that would help consumers process these materials. I think part of it is the challenge of, you know, not really understanding what they can do with some of the materials. And I think that really what would make it more appealing too is to really just make everyone aware of the critical link between food waste and food scrap diversion and packaging and compostable packaging and how that can aid in that. Because really, frankly, as in vogue as, or as positive as recycling is, you can't recycle certain materials and food soiled materials are exactly that. And so I think that if people really understand this and that in the right applications, compostable options just completely make sense and they can be processed quite easily along with all of this stuff, I think that will really help support. So definitely some consumer education, lawmaker education, and uh, you mentioned in between methane, and um, I feel that uh, there is also that possibility of being able to generate gas from both sewage and compost waste. Do people look at that as a possibility, again, for economic value that you kind of uh, generate more gas, utilize that gas, and then create compost? Does that even pass? Uh, have you come across that conversation at all or no? So for some reason, in, so I know in Europe, um, they do a lot more of this, but uh, where they're, you know, have much greater shortage of natural gas. And um, but I feel like in the U.S., well, at least in California, there isn't a lot of support of any kind of waste to energy or um and that's just that's within the framework and the kind of the beliefs of California. I think all, there might be some resistance other places, but that would be something that I would think would be worth exploring, particularly as we look to power more things and, you know, a bigger population using renewable alternatives. It definitely makes sense. Yeah, I hope that will come into more conversation as well, because there is hidden value. There's energy you know, energy in those products. So the more we utilize it in different ways, the better it is. So what are your greatest challenges now? If you were to think about three greatest challenges that I have for the next year or two years, what would they be? Would be SB 54, just making sure that 
we improve those regulations so that we have a future in California, because right now those are presenting a very serious challenge. I would say also engaging on all of the other EPR programs. We, I think we had 40 bills introduced this last session across 15 different states and the volume of activity is just continuing to grow. So just really keeping up with that and trying to get more people to engage, um, you know, working with as broad a, a group of industry partners as possible and really just educating on all of the stuff that's going on and, and getting a bigger group of advocates that are out there weighing in on the issues and spreading the word and working on all these great projects and sharing information. Well, count us in for sure. Perfect, <laughs> you know, <yeah. laughs> we are with you, and you know, you know the right person in our team already. So, yes, so, I know. so yeah. Alex will be very happy to to work and and to grow his understanding as well as support the industry more in in this direction. And uh, uh, my second to last question, and it's kind of very interestingly. Uh, intricately kind of uh, linked. Normally what I ask is how do you see scale going forward as a company? But in your case, it's a little bit uh, different uh, because I find there are a couple of issues that uh, when they when look at it from a consumer's perspective, they say that part of the reason they cannot switch to a compostable product is because the compostable product manufacturers like you and us don't have scale. So they need certain thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of tons and because of that, they're not being able to switch. So, so in keeping with that, how do you see CJ and others building towards that scale in the next few years, enabled by policy to be able to make to, to be able to help that consumer make that change? You know, so if you would think about like a Frito Lay shifting to a PHA based product mm -hmm. in the next couple of years, that would probably mean you know five hundred thousand tons of material, and of course, it has to be multiple people. So how do you see that scale happening in the next maybe five years? Well, I think that there there is a good good fair share of scale at this point, and that I think there are a lot of big companies, CJ being one of the biggest, that have the capacity, the existing footprint across the globe to really produce and manufacture these products to meet demand. And I, I know there are other investments that are happening. I think that the the regulatory environment is making it a little challenging for brands and to really fully commit. Um, and I think the infrastructure to process it needs to be really developed. And so assuming all those things come together, we get some more clarity, we get some more infrastructure um, in place. I think that we could meet scale. I know you're, you're talking about very large numbers, but I think that um, it's definitely possible. I think another thing that we're really looking at is home compostable and that brands are pushing for because of this kind of as maybe even an interim solution, but because of this concern over the regulatory space and challenges and wall infrastructure is developing, I think there's a lot um, looking at home compostability as well as one of the big applications that PHA is really suited for. Yeah, I think PHA has so many positives and it's, of course, a lot of buzz as well. And I hope that buzz keeps growing for humanity overall, because it's also created from a, a, a mostly a waste. And then that's that's really amazing. And what what the PHA industry is doing right now is really commendable. Um, and that takes me to my last question. What does good garbage mean to you? Good garbage is supported by good policy. Uh, for garbage to ultimately go to its, you know, best, highest valuable spot, it needs to have supportive policy in place that will achieve that. That's my biased answer. <laughs> no, no, it's a wonderful answer because I was talking to the person who edits our videos for YouTube and she told me that, you know, people answer very similar things when you ask them good garbage. And I'm glad I'm going to I'm going to pass this on to her before she gets to edit your okay. video that, you know, see, this is going to be a different answer. It is something that is supported by policy because it is because without mm -hmm. that, we couldn't we couldn't possibly exist in the kind of space that we do because it is it is everything is led by that. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for joining us. This has been such a pleasure. It has been a good brain scrub for me uh, in terms of how things work. Um, 
I'm excited about what you're going to bring to the industry in terms of changes in policy and thinking of the legislators. We are, of course, very keen and we'll partner mm-hmm. with you wherever you want so that we can all do this. And I hope that the listeners who will listen to this will be multiple companies and they'll start writing to you and uh, giving their support so that you can lead the charge and we'll join you in the process. Thank you so much Great. for taking the time and more more power to you as you go forward. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.